Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, otherwise I think we're ready to go. Um, second machine learning talk this afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Jamie Shotton. Actually, uh, Jamie is another of our former PhD scholars. When, when did you start, Jamie? Because we just heard uh, from John that he was the number one yes. five years before the official launch of the program. Yeah, Where? 2003, I think. Okay, so you were just before the official launch of the program. Um, and now Jamie is a re senior researcher in the machine learning group. Um, Jamie's been, uh, been quite influential on the Connect work, and he's also for this work just received a prestigious uh, award by the IEEE uh, Pattern Analysis Mat Machine Intelligence Committee called Young Researcher Award, so congratulations on those. Uh, and, and then the ne next hour you'll take us to, uh, to the technology that makes the Connect, connect tick. Great. Thank Thanks, Scarlett. Um, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, great to see so many uh, faces here, and uh, it was great to talk to some of you at the poster session earlier. Okay, so I'm going to be talking uh, a little bit about human skeletal tracking, and in particular, telling uh, our story um, from you know the MSR Cambridge perspective of uh, the development of Connect. So at this point, Connect does not. I think need too much introduction. Um, it's essentially a, a, a camera that uh, plugs into your, your uh, Xbox or your, your PC um, and combines a number of, of technologies, particularly on the Xbox side, um, where uh, we take the, the camera itself is able to sense, sense depth, depth rather than just a, a standard camera's RGB. Um, we built some software that does uh, real-time human skeletal tracking. Uh, and follows your, your body motions in real time. Uh, and it's got face and voice recognition. And the, the combination of these new technologies, um, when it launched, really uh, opened up some very new applications, especially in gaming, uh, but more, more broadly, as we'll see, too. Um, so, so our involvement here was primarily on, uh, on the, uh, the second of those, those technologies, this, this human skeletal tracking or human motion tracking. Um, the idea, uh, in, uh, as it started, was that you'd be able to stand in your living room in front of the, the camera, move your body, the, the camera is able to see what you're doing, understand what you're doing, track your motion, and that motion can then be translated into the game to allow you to, to play games without having to hold a controller or to wear a, a, a suit or anything like that. And so... Um, Today, uh, this is sort of where we're going. We're going to uh, start by having a quick introduction to visual recognition, visual object recognition. Um, then we'll, we'll talk about uh, Project Natal, which was the code name for, for Connect and how, that, how we got involved, um, how the project developed. Um, and we'll sort of then sort of do, do a little bit of a deep dive on body part recognition, which is the algorithm we came up with to, to enable this to be robust and to, to work for everyone out of the box. And then at the end, we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time just uh, looking at some, uh, some follow-on pieces of work uh, that have come out of this. Okay, so let's dive in with visual recognition, visual object recognition. Um, we can all look at this car and, you know, it's obvious it's a, it's a car. It's obvious it's a red car in a field. Uh, and if you look closely, it's a Ferrari. So, you know, this is trivial for us. But, of course... To a computer, this is just a grid of, of numbers, of RGB values. Um, and, and so we're going to have to somehow interpret this, this grid of numbers to be able to, to infer high-level things about the, the image that we, that we want that might be useful. Now, this is uh, made challenging due to a number of uh, problems. Uh, first of all, you can view objects from all sorts of different angles. Uh, you can have very different lighting at night or silhouette. I mean, these, these are going to be extreme examples, but they'll illustrate the points, I think. Uh, scale, uh, objects look very different close up to far away. Uh, the pose of the object, um, again, some quite extreme examples there. Uh, occlusions uh, and the environment. So all of these things, to some extent, you're going to have to think about when you're, you're dealing with uh, visual object recognition. 
And clearly, trying to sort of code all of the possibilities of all of these things uh, by hand is going to be rather impractical. And so, um, in the last 10 years plus, uh, there's been obviously a big trend towards using machine learning uh, to do this kind of thing. And, you know, I've got this cartoon in the middle here, but what does machine learning do really? Fundamentally, you take some training data. Perhaps we're going to try and disambiguate images that contain seats from non-seats. Uh, we're going to program in some features or have them learned as well. Uh, and then we're going to let this thing churn away and do its, uh, do its uh, number crunching, and it will come out with some encapsulated learned model, some representation of the, the training data and the patterns in there, such that then you can pass in some test images, uh, say an image with a seat in it, and it will say seat, or an image with a car in it, and say not a seat. So this is a very, very toy, uh, trivial example, but um, is, is the general um, paradigm that we're going to be using here. Now, um, you know, as Scarlett mentioned, I was one of the uh, lucky enough to be one of the PhD scholars in the very early days before the program had even really officially started. Um, and, you know, I was looking at this stuff in my PhD, and I didn't really think that there was any particularly interesting applications thereof. But, you know, it seemed fun. It seemed like a good, good idea at the time. So, you know, the first thing we looked at was could we find horses in images um, by looking at their sort of outline contours? Uh, and fragments of those contours and stitching those together. Uh, and then we moved um, uh, a year or two later into trying to do this task of semantic segmentation, where you try and label every pixel in an image with a number of different object categories, um, and then sort of turn that into a coherent segmentation where we also have the labels. Uh, and then we even took that a bit further uh, and made this you know, fast. This was, you know, back in 2008, running at about 10 frames a second on a laptop. Um, so, you know, as I say, at the time we thought, you know, great, this is fun, but um, okay, what's the best application we can think of? Maybe image search, but um, nothing particularly practical. But um, it turns out uh, it will have some application, as you'll see uh, as we go on. So, um, you know, I joined uh, MSR here uh, full time as a postdoc in 2008, uh, about you know June or so, um, and then sort of a couple of months later, you can see I got this email out of the blue from a guy called Mark, um, who worked in Xbox, and he had seen some of my PhD research and wanted to discuss an important scenario with me. Um, as you can see, this is a Thursday evening at eight o'clock. I think I uh, just got home. I sort of picked up my email and you know replied to him said, yeah, sure, sure, let's, let's talk. Um, how about, how would next Tuesday do? That seems like the first available date on my calendar. Uh, and he wrote back and, uh, that evening, uh, a bit later, and said, how about now? Um, <laughs> so thankfully, I said, said yes, OK, fine, I'll, I'll, we'll take this, see where it goes. Um, and um, he described what uh, was, at the time, known as Project Natal, this, this idea that we would have a, uh, we'd, we'd be trying to track the human body in front of uh, a camera in the living room. Um, now, this sounded a little far-fetched to us at the time, um, and uh, I'll explain why. Um, so the, 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 the task is really what's called human pose estimation. Um, and the idea is you're going to take some input, uh, here a, a cartoon image, and you're going to try and find the positions of the various joints in the body, and you're going to join those up into a skeleton here. And really, you want to do this in 3D, because that will give you a lot more information. So what does that mean? You're going to have the x, y, z coordinates for each of the joints, um, or, or equivalently, sort of the, the angles between the different joints in the body. And if you could do this, you could get something that looked a bit like this. So you'd take uh, a video sequence on the left, and you'd get uh, some kind of 3D skeleton representation over time on the right, and the idea being that it would be much easier to do all sorts of gesture recognition uh, or you know, physically-based manipulation using the, the signal on the right, which is a very low-dimensional, uh, abstracted representation of, of what you're doing with your body, rather than trying to interpret uh, at every frame the, the image that you're seeing. Um, but this, as I say, was something we thought was a bit far-fetched, because um, it's quite hard, um, and it's hard for multiple reasons, not just the reasons that I showed you for the general class of 
um, object recognition, you know, viewpoint, lighting, scale, etc. But also because humans have an incredible variety in the, uh, in the, the poses they can get their bodies into. Um, not just that, but you know, people come in different shapes and sizes. Uh, people wear clothing, have hairstyle, carry things. Um, and you know, with a real sensor, you might have uh, problems of, of cropping, of the, the field of view sensor not seeing the whole person at once. And then you've got issues like, well, the person may be wearing the same colored clothing as the background. There's someone hiding in the bushes there. Uh, and you might have um, you know, clutter. Uh, you might have lots of people crowding together. Now, again, these are kind of extreme examples, um, but to some extent, we're going to have to solve all of these issues to, to be able to ship something that works for everyone in their living rooms. OK, so, so fine. How do, how do people approach this in the past? Well, um, one approach is what's called motion capture. This is what Hollywood uses to make animated movies. Well, well what happens is you, you, you don a suit, the suit has all these, these uh, white markers on it. And you've got a very carefully calibrated rig of cameras uh, set up, you know, maybe 10, 20 cameras uh, set up around the room. And they're tracking these white blobs. And then based on those, are reconstructing your motion. And this works beautifully. It's just very expensive. And you couldn't possibly set this up in everyone's living room. So computer vision has been trying to go after this task for a long time as well. Um, and um, here's sort of three axes upon which uh, different approaches have, have varied in how they, how, how they go about solving this. Uh, and we'll just talk briefly through each of these. So the first one is, is whether you, you're looking at a single image, a single monocular image, or whether you're using stereo or 3D information somehow. The second one is whether you're tracking motion over time or whether you're just predicting one frame at a time. And the third is whether you're trying to infer the pose of the whole body or whether you're trying to break up the body into parts and uh, somehow stitch those together. So we'll come back to these as we go. So Mark, uh, you know, when I was chatting with him, he also mentioned some of the requirements that we had to fulfill for this. Um, so it had to work for any human pose, had to work for any body shape and size. Uh, we weren't allowed to calibrate on the user or instrument the user. And for some definition of never fail, it must never fail. Uh, so that sounded hard. And then he said, oh, and by the way, it has to run on the Xbox 360. And we're only allowed to use 10% of its compute resources because the games have to run. So that sounded even harder. So OK, um, at this point, we were like, OK, no hope, no hope. Um, oh, oh, and there's one, one, one more thing. This was mid-2008. He said, we've got. Uh, about a year and a half to get this thing completely done out the door from nothing through research, through productization. So yeah, th this, this sounded like uh, an impossible vision at the time. But uh, a couple of things did give us some hope. So the first thing um, was the, the depth camera. So this is the first image that um, uh, Mark sent me of the, you know, the signal that you get off this new, this new, at the time, new depth sensing camera. Um, and it was quite, I thought it was quite remarkable. I mean, you can see uh, there's uh, detail on the face up there. Uh, you don't have the problem of the, sort of the hand in front of the body sort of not, you can tell that this hand is separate from the, the rest of the body. Um, and there's all sorts of nice properties in here. So how, how does this camera work? Well, here's, here's the original Kinect. The new Kinect is a little bit different, but um, you know, somewhat similar anyway. Uh, so this camera has these three windows on the front. On the left, we've got an infrared emitter that's shining out uh, some infrared light. You've got a standard RGB camera in the middle, which is really only used for face recognition and for video conferencing. And then on the, the right there, you've got the infrared camera that's picking up the light reflecting in the scene from this emitter. And these two, the infrared emitter camera pair, form the, the, the depth camera. And this is based on a principle called structured light. So the idea really is that the, the infrared emitter that I showed you on the left is shining out a, a sort of pseudo-random pattern of dots into the world, which you can think of as a, a sort of a barcode. And according to where the object is in the scene, whether it's a, if it was at depth D1 here, you'd see the barcode would hit the surface there, 
be reflected here and land at this position here um, on, uh, on the imaging plane uh, in the infrared camera. If instead the light had continued to an object further away at this position here, it would get reflected and appear at a slightly different position, translated horizontally uh, in the image, on the imaging plane. And by knowing that we're expecting a particular pattern uh, somewhere along that line and searching for it, you can essentially infer the depth information. And just to sort of visualize that, I'll play a video in the top right there um, as, the, um, pers uh, as the, the sheet of paper here is moved backwards and forwards. You'll see this pattern of dots is translating left and right. Okay, so that's structured light, and what happens when you do this, oops, let's just go back a second. Uh, so, is this going to play? Here we go. Okay, so the image that you'll get looks something like this, um, and because it's a, a, a depth camera and you have all the calibration details, you can actually take the, the depth values and the x, y coordinates, and that will get, that's enough to give you the 3D coordinates. And so you can then sort of create virtual views from the side or from the top. So for the particular task of human pose estimation that we were going after, turns out that depth has some rather nice properties. Um, it's going to work in low light. So if people want to play games in their living room uh, and they turn the lights off, it will be no problem. Um, as I've already suggested, the, sort of the, the, there's, there's easy segmentation of the foreground from the background. You also know the, the scale of the objects that you're seeing, or at least uh, you know exactly how far they are metrically away from the camera. Um, and you don't have to worry about, simu uh, you know, uh, about dealing with differences in color and texture of clothing, of skin, of hair. Um, it's all sort of this uniform gray that that just measures depth, so that's, that's really nice. And so, of course, people have uh, had been looking at uh, using depth signals, often from stereo cameras, um, uh, but sort of starting to use depth cameras by the time we were starting to look at this. But none of them had managed to take anything out of the lab. They'd been focusing very much on, you know, getting a few toy sequences working, but not really uh, going after the, the thing that anyone can just jump in and use. And that's because of these, these quite difficult remaining challenges. So uh, pose variation, size and shape variation, image cropping, and, and clothing, etc. So I said that the, the depth camera was the first thing that uh, made us think, OK, maybe we can, we can solve this. And the other thing that made us think that this, is, this might be ripe for, uh, you know, this might be ready uh, for the world was, was this video that they sent us. So this is an early prototype system that the Xbox team had developed. You'll see there there's a sort of point, point cloud in the background of dots of a person that walks up to this skeleton. And when they get into the right position in, and they're standing like this, uh, it sort of locks on and they can dance around and uh, follow the person. And we saw this and we were, we were blown away. This was amazing. Um, we said, OK, so you've solved this already. Why, why are you talking to us at all? I mean, <laughs> job done. Um, uh, and it turned out that the, the reason they were talking to us is that this wasn't particularly robust. So what do I mean by that? Um, so as I say, this is a tracking solution. So the idea is that you know where you are uh, approximately at time t, and you observe uh, a new depth frame at time t plus 1, and then you try and uh, make some prediction based on where you were about where you will be. And when this works, you know, this works beautifully, as we, as we saw. It gives you a nice, smooth result. It's relatively efficient. Um, however, it's got two little issues. One is that you have to initialize it somehow. So that's why the person walked up like that and had to sort of walk into the, exactly the right position, and then it sort of locked on. Um, the other problem is that if you move unpredictably, uh, too quickly, or, or suddenly, uh, then it can lose track. It, it, you know, it will sometimes. Um, not be able to predict what your motion in, uh, from the, the future, and then it will be too far away, excuse me, from a, uh, from a good solution to be able to sort of refine the estimate to the correct answer. And so any solution that's purely based on tracking like this is, is liable to, to catastrophic failure. 
And so it became clear that our, our mission effectively was, was the following. We were going to try and um, take uh, the algorithm I just showed you and, and augment it with a, a sort of initialization uh, ability so that we didn't have to stand up like that and also to detect and recover from, from failures. Okay, so how might one go about this? Well, uh, the first thing we thought of Sorry. Click, click, click. First thing we thought of was, was this, the idea that you would match uh, the whole pose of the person at once. So, you know, if you saw the full image of the person, then you just sort of run through a flip book, essentially, uh, of, of images of people in different poses and find the closest, the nearest neighbor. Uh, and you could do that reasonably efficiently using some kind of hierarchy. And, you know, there was prior art that, that showed that you could do a reasonable job with that. Um, but the problem with this approach is that it's, it's exponential. The, the number of poses you have to represent is exponential in the number of joints you have. Because for every pose I can get my right arm in, I can jointly get my left arm into the same number of poses. And so it's very hard to, to scale this up, which is kind of why it's a little bit jerky there on the right. Um, and we sort of actually tried out this and implemented a, a prototype uh, similar system. And you see it works, you know, quite well um, at the moment. But then as soon, because we hadn't trained it on, on this, as soon as he brings up the other arm, it's not able to, to track that. And so we'd need to essentially square our training data just for that other arm. And then if we tr throw in the legs, et cetera, and then all the crops, we, we quickly realized that this was not going to be the thing that, would, that, that filled the need we had. And so, um, the alternative to matching the whole body is to try and match parts of the body. And so, we quickly realized that this was going to be a, a, a good thing to do. And then, just the question was, how, how can we do this? And how can we do it efficiently? And how do we get around all of those uh, sort of nuisance factors of pose and, and shape, uh, et cetera, that we've seen? Well, the solution that we hit on is um, the following. It's called body part recognition. The idea is that you're going to uh, go through every pixel in your depth image and try and classify that pixel into one of a number of different parts of the body. Uh, so that, the, say, the right hand might be this orange color. Uh, and that as you move your hand, no matter what position you put your hand in, it will always stay that orange color. And no matter what your body shape is as well. So it's going to be a local estimate, we're going to basically base that prediction on that pixel in the depth image and some local region around the image, um, such that we can essentially decouple all the joints in the body and we don't have this exponential blow up in the, the number of poses. And this leads to reduced training uh, data requirements and reduced uh, training time. We we're going to take um, a frame-by-frame -frame approach. So we were not going to use any temporal information at all because of the problems of robustness um, that we've discussed already. And it had to be very fast. Uh, you know, we had this very, very tight compute budget, so we had to uh, fit into that somehow. Um, and the, the particular approach that I'll describe in a second was based on extremely simple depth uh, image comparison, pixel comparison features um, integrated into a, a decision forest classifier that could be implemented in parallel on the GPU. And uh, so the, the final algorithm that we ended up with, the final pipeline for, for skeletal tracking on, on Kinect looks a bit like this. So we first capture the depth image off the camera and remove the background, which I'm not going to go into detail on here. Um, then we're going to infer these body part labels at every pixel in the image. And then we can cluster those uh, across different pixels to produce hypotheses about where the different joints are, these crosses here. And finally, we can take those hypotheses about the joint positions in 3D uh, and fit those together into a skeleton. And again, I'm not going to talk about that today, but we'll talk about these two uh, bits in some detail. OK, so let's start by looking at this. So um, as I mentioned, we're going to try and classify each pixel into one of a number of different body parts. And we're going to do that based on some 
window of the depth image around that pixel. So for example, the pixel up here on the hand, we're going to sub extract some window here and base all our features on that. Now we don't actually have to exactly, like really extract that feature. You can just sort of, this is a conceptual way of thinking about it. You can just leave the original image as, as is and just allow your features to access a, a small portion of the image. Now, it turns out that this is basically exactly the same uh, thing as what I was doing in my PhD. So, you know, despite the fact not knowing uh, any particularly sensible applications at the time, um, turns out that it does have an application and it's, uh, and it's for body part recognition and connect. So, um, you never know quite when, you know, something that you're, you're doing blue skies research could turn out to be kind of useful. Um, so, and then, then the other challenge was how to deal with these, um, these, these problems. And we were going to take the approach of just training it with tons and tons of data such that the machine learning would deal with um, all of these nuisances, all of these in, uh, invariances that we needed to encode. Um, and, and just hope for the best, you know, throw it all in, let it churn away, hope we had the, the capacity in our learners to, to be able to, to deal with that. So to do that, we needed some training data. And so here's an example of, of some of the data that we captured to start with. This is some real data from a, a Connect. And someone has sort of painstakingly hand-labeled uh, all of these using some paint interface. Now, clearly, this is not going to scale particularly well. And we'll see how we um, come, come, we'll come back to how we get around that in a second. Um, but you can see that what we're just going to try and do is we're going to provide, this is the input, this is the, the desired output, and our machine learning algorithm will try and learn the mapping from pixels here to pixels here. But to do that, it's going to need some features, some, uh, some features. And how do we, uh, what, how could we extract useful information from the depth image? Now, again, because we're on a very tight budget, compute budget, we're going to uh, keep these very, very simple. Um, and essentially, they're, they're you know, in incredibly simple. Es essentially, at this pixel x, um, what we're going to do is we're going to compare the, the depth value at that pixel with the depth value at some pixel that's been offset by uh, some delta. Now, why might this be a good thing to do? Well, in this particular posi uh, pixel, uh, position x, you'll get some large, uh, you know, the magnitude of the difference of those two pixels uh, in depth will be quite large because one's on the object and one's in the background, which we're saying is going to be far away. If you move to a different position, if you were trying to classify this pixel down here, you'll get a similar uh, large difference. However, if you were to move over to a point on the other side of the body, the difference in depth between these two uh, pixels is going to be much, much smaller. And so you can well imagine that uh, this particular sort of delta offset might be a useful um, feature to help disambiguate the left side of the body from the right side of the body. By similar reasoning, you can see that a feature like this that looks upwards might help discriminate these two points uh, near the top of the body from, a point, uh, from points lower down on the body like that one. Um, and we can go one step further by saying that because we've got depth information, we know, and we know how perspective works in, in images. As you get further away, these, these deltas should get smaller. So we can just scale those offsets by uh, the, the depth of the pixel that you care about, um, such that if you were twice as far away and the image was half the size, these offsets would also be half the size. So this gives us depth invariance essentially for free. But individually, these features are going to be you know, almost useless. They're just marginally above above useless. Uh, but that, it turns out, is enough. And it's enough because we can combine them in, um, in at least the way we did it, was a, a decision tree classifier. So how does this work? Well, you pass in you know, this image window centered at pixel x into the root, uh, root node of this tree. We evaluate one of those features, perhaps the one that looks left. And that gives us some, some depth difference. And we compare that to some learned threshold. And according to that comparison, we're going to branch left or right. Let's say we branch left. We're then going to look up a different feature, perhaps the one that looked upwards, uh, compared to a different threshold. And again, we'll branch left or right. For the sake of uh, simplicity, let's imagine we had reached a, a leaf node here. 
And at the leaf node in the tree, we're going to store some distribution, uh, just a normalized histogram of all of the labels from the training set that reach that node. And you can imagine how the rest of the, the tree pans out. But notice that there's, there's this sort of conditional computation going on. So the feature that you evaluate at the second layer here is dependent on what happened at the first layer. And as you get deeper and deeper and deeper, what this means is you get you know, a, a lot of representational power. How do you train these? Well, relatively simple. You take all of the um, pixels in all of your training images um, and you create, you start with a, a sort of a root node in your tree and you can build a histogram of all the body part labels in the, the ground truth. And at the root node, you'd expect it to be sort of roughly uniform because all of these parts are roughly the same size. And then what you're going to do is hypothesize a large number of candidate features and thresholds and test each of them to see how it splits the data. So for each of those features, th feature threshold pairs, uh, it will induce some partition on your, your input data into a left set and a right set. And again, you can compute those um, empirical uh, distributions of the, the training labels. Um, and then you can just compute uh, the, the entropy, or, uh, the information gain uh, that, you, that that particular candidate gave you. Um, and that will, and then what you do is you just take the one that gives you the, the largest information gain and reduces, maximally reduces the entropy, the uncertainty. And if you keep doing this and you keep growing deeper and deeper trees, obviously much deeper than what I just showed you, um, your hope is that you can drive the entropy at the leaves to zero, which means you're completely certain that this, if you reach this leaf at test time, that, that this class is the one you should be predicting. Um, obviously, this is a very, very short uh, uh, introduction to this. If you are interested um, in this kind of stuff uh, in more detail, we have written a book which has all sorts of um, tutorial in it, uh, comes with some software and stuff like that. So, you know, excuse the quick plug, but um, I hope you'd find it useful. Okay, so we did that. Um, and we did, we trained it up on a small set of data and then if we, this is sort of one of the first videos we had of the system running live and it kind of half works. Um, you can see that these parts are, uh, are following me around as I'm moving around in the office. There's some problems there with the background subtraction at the time. Um, but on the whole, you know, modulo a lot of noise and uh, incorrect classifications, it, it sort of got the core structure at least quite, quite nicely. So that was our sort of proof of concept. And, and from there, we, were, we, we thought, OK, well, hopefully, all we need to do now is just push on this, uh, turn the handle, get more data, um, generate, uh, you know, train these things up to deeper depths, uh, more complicated structures. And so that's what we did. So how did we deal with this data problem? Because obviously painting all of those images by hand is, is extremely painful and uh, not, you, you're never going to be able to scale up. And so we turn to uh, computer graphics. And thankfully, depth images are relatively easy to synthetically generate using just standard graphics uh, pipelines. Um, much easier, it turns out, than RGB, where you'd have to sim uh, simulate all the clothing and you know, texture and hair and et cetera. So we went to a mocap studio, recorded uh, a lot of mocap, uh, distilled that down to what we thought was uh, a useful set of poses that span the uh, space of motion that we would be interested in. We could then retarget that to different um, body ca uh, characters, to different shapes and sizes. And that al allowed us to sort of uh, quickly scale up without having to record um, lots and lots and lots more data for each different body shape. And then we could just render as basically as much training data as, as we wanted um, with both the depth image and the body part labels. Um, uh, and so we could generate essentially an infinite training set. Um, here's just a, a video of what that looks like in practice. Um, this is a, a deep zoom image where we've, we've just splatted down a, a million of these training images uh, into one canvas and you can sort of see the, the variety that's in there and this, the scale of this thing as well. Um, and I wonder if you can guess what it's going to spell out when you zoom out. Uh, so that's what a million images looks like.
OK, so we have now our training data. We have our features. We have our learning algorithm. Let's see what happens. So we train this up. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you now an example of, of the, the importance of, of training very deep trees. Um, so there's a couple of uh, test input images on the left here. In the middle, we've got the ground truth body part labels that we want the system to predict. And on the right, I'm going to show you an animation of um, what happens as you go deeper and deeper in the, in the tree. So if you go to, to depth two, that means you've done exactly one test at every uh, pixel in your image. What it's decided to learn, we didn't tell it this, it decided to learn that one of these features that looks upwards and looks quite a long distance uh, is, is the right thing to do. So it's, able to, it's decided that segmenting the, the top half of the body from the bottom half of the body is a good thing. Now, because of the, the, the way that the features work, you've got this sort of ghostly silhouette of the, the head there, but that will get corrected later on, as you'll see. On this sort of somewhat harder image down here, it's also doing a reasonable job, although it's, uh, you know, the position of the, the, the lower half is, is somewhat different. Again, this is something that it's going to learn to correct, correct as it goes. So if we go one layer deeper, this means that every pixel has had two tests, although a different two tests according to what, what happened at the, first, at the root node. Uh, it's now decided that it wants to split the left half of the body from the right half of the body. Um, similarly down here, it's, it's doing a reasonable job there. So if we keep training uh, deeper and deeper and deeper, by the time we get to about depth 10, we're starting to get a lot of structure up here that's uh, matching this uh, the ground truth reasonably well. And you're doing okay down here on this harder example, but it's got to say it's got a, a big mistake here where it thinks the back of the person is, is the head. And that's because, you know, it's decided that with only 10 tests, the best thing it can do uh, is it, the most sort of, uh, the, the way to maximize accuracy on your training set is to, is to make that mistake. Uh, but if we keep training deeper and deeper and deeper, by the time we get to about 17 or 18, um, we're now correcting that mistake. So the back is now correct, and the head's coming out in roughly the correct place. Uh, but also, this easier image here is giving a much uh, more confident uh, and correct answer. And I can sort of visualize this um, uh, on a graph as well. Um, uh, what we were just looking at is sort of the results of, of this red curve as we uh, increase the, num the depth in the trees, the accuracy keeps going up. Now, for comparison, I've got, that was on, on the large, the full training set. Uh, if we train with a much smaller set, 15,000 images only, you can see what's uh, a, a, an instance of overfitting here. So there's so many parameters in your tree by the depth 18 um, that it's, it's, it's sort of being, uh, and there's so little data with only 15,000 images that it's not being able to fit very good models there and it start, the test accuracy is therefore starting to go down even though the training accuracy would have continued to go up. Um, so how, uh, so you know, in, in terms of the final system that we ended up with, we had to scale it up to these 31 different body parts. We trained a forest of, of three different trees uh, to depth 20. Uh, obviously that's a lot of nodes. Uh, we trained off about a million images. Uh, with about 2,000 pixels per image um, and about 10,000 of those um, feature, feature threshold uh, tests, uh, features that, that, we, uh, that we looked at earlier. Now, this sounds expensive. It was. Uh, it took about a week on a fairly large cluster at the time, although you could do it a lot quicker now, of course. Um, but the very nice property was the test time was really efficient. So uh, each pixel, you only had to evaluate uh, 20 times three uh, feature evaluations per pixel, and each of those could be evaluated in parallel on, a G on the GPU that we had in the Xbox. Um, and so that made you know, all this training worth it. You could do all the hard work uh, offline, and then you'd have a lightweight uh, system that you could deploy to your users, um, and it would run very quickly. And this is what it uh, kind of looked like when we uh, had finished with it. So. On the left, you're seeing a sequence of, of depth images coming off the camera, and on the right, the, the body parts, which are now you know, following the body a lot better than they were with the smaller training set, uh, with more complex motion, uh, different, you know, a different uh, person in this case. Uh, and note that there's no tracking or smoothing here. This is all per frame uh, independent, and so we don't have this issue of robustness uh, to worry about.
So that was the, um, the second stage in this pipeline. Let's just very, very briefly look at the, the third stage here. Essentially, what you do is you, you take the um, predictions uh, from here. These are probabilities. Uh, and you take the uh, depth image here. And you use the depth image to work out the sort of 3D point cloud of, of, of pixels that correspond to, to this. And you take the probabilities from here. And you just sort of throw those out into, into a sort of a 3D probability cloud. And then you just run some clustering. Uh, we used a mean shift clustering algorithm, but I'm sure you could use other clustering algorithms. And that gave you um, these, these hypotheses about the body joints. It might give you 0, 1, 2, or more hypotheses about each joint. Um, but let's have a look at what this might look like in a video. So this is the same video on the top row. And on the bottom row, you're now seeing uh, the front side and top views uh, of the same sequence where the gray points are the, um, the, depth, the, the depth pixels that have been um, the, the 3D point cloud of these depth pixels. And the colored squares are the predictions, these hypotheses about the, the joint positions. And again, these are just done um, with, uh, without any, any tracking, just frame by frame. And so you can well imagine that if you start to take those and uh, stitch those together, uh, then you can do this um, thing relatively easily. There's actually a lot more to that um, that I'm not going to uh, talk about today. But um, you know, that, this is uh, the step that incorporates the, the temporal information. Because you don't want to throw out temporal information. It is useful. Um, but you have to use it in the right way. And you have to have a, a constant source, source of reinitialization to make sure you're robust. Um, so that it, the fit skeleton stage it, it exploits the temporal information, also exploits kinematic constraints so that uh, you know, the, the, the distance between the wrist and the elbow uh, is roughly the same as uh, from one uh, arm to the other and roughly the same uh, as the uh, elbow to the shoulder. Um, and so that, uh, so that was that. Um, and uh, you know, after a lot of hard work and uh, sleepless nights, we, we, we got this thing out the door. Uh, it's launched uh, in... When is it? Is it 2010? I think November 2010. Um, and, uh, you know, did remarkably well. Certainly uh, exceeded all of our expectations. Uh, there was a fun launch party in L.A. with an animatronic elephant and uh, all sorts of things. Um, did you go? I did go, yes. Yes, it was, it was good. I didn't get to ride the elephant. But. <laughs> um, and, of course, there were some, some really fun games. Um, and that was what, what it was all about. But um, very quickly after launch, it became apparent that there was a lot of enthusiasm for using Connect for other things. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll just play a little video. It's a little bit of a cheesy marketing video, so please excuse that. But um, it's, quite, it's quite nice and illustrates the point, at least. This will be fun to play with. And it was. But something amazing is happening. The world is starting to imagine things we hadn't even thought of. Unexpected things. Helpful things. Beautiful things. Inspired things. Which is why, even though the world keeps asking us what we'll do with Connect next, we're just as excited to ask the world the same thing. Okay, so I don't think I would advise any of you to try and build a bomb disposal unit using Connect yet. <laughs> However, there were some, some real things and real projects that we did uh, in there. The medical example with the, um, the doctor in the operating theater sort of controlling uh, the, the display using gestures so that they don't have to touch a keyboard or mouse. And the uh, worldwide telescope example where you could 
you know, zoom through space by, by gestures. Those were both real, real things. And I'm sure there are you know, other, other things. That physiotherapy is clearly something that people are very interested in using this technology for. But you know, more generally, you know, Connect is uh, opening up a lot of avenues for uh, new research and, and products that, that wouldn't have been possible without the abstraction that the depth camera gives you or that the, the skeleton uh, tracking gives you. Um, and it's, you know, it is very exciting to see what's, what's going on um, with that. So I'll just end with a couple of um, quick uh, examples of, of some of the stuff we did afterwards. Um, this isn't the very latest stuff, um, but uh, it's, I think it's quite interesting. So the first example here is, is Connect Fusion. So the idea in this work would, is that you, you, know, you pick up the Connect camera and you, you sort of move it around the room and start scanning in your world. And the Connect Fusion algorithm is essentially, first of all, working out where your camera has moved in 3D relative to the previous uh, frame and, and, and building up that camera trajectory over time, but also in the background building up a detailed uh, 3D reconstruction of the scene and averaging out a lot of the noise that you see uh, in the input image on the top left here. So you get these really nice, smooth uh, reconstructions on the bottom right. And you know, this, this work is all relatively small scale scenes and static scenes. And since then, we've been building on that, doing much larger scenes, doing whole bookstores, um, and do, dealing with uh, motion and, and deforming objects as they, as they move. So you don't have to have a static scene. Um, uh, another thing that we looked at was basically taking the same machine learning approach, this, this uh, pixel-wise classification, and going after a, a, a slightly different task, which is uh, open and closed uh, gr uh, hand detection. Um, because the original uh, system that we launched just had the hand position. It couldn't tell you what you were doing with your hands. Um, and so you'll see here as uh, Jem, who's a postdoc with us, moves his uh, hands around and opens them and closes them. When they close, they turn red because we've trained this off, off data of, of people's hands open and closed. Uh, and when they're open, they go blue. And so you can now, now you've got a sort of uh, a grasp signal. You've got a, an engage signal, which we didn't have before. And that opens up a lot of uh, fun applications. So here's a, an example with a map. Uh, and you can uh, you know, uh, essentially uh, simulate the pinch, uh, the, the pinch zoom effect on, on, uh, on, the, on a surface, on a, on a, a touch device with an in-air, no-touch uh, kind of pinch zoom thing. And we'll have this running, I think, on Thursday um, for the demo session, and you can have a play around with it. Um, and we have done, you know, subsequent to this, we've been doing a lot of work on, on fully articulated hand tracking, which is uh, an even more exciting and uh, challenging topic. I'm happy to chat with you about that if you're interested. Okay, so I will wrap up. Um, I think, you know, one of the key messages is, is you know, go do amazing stuff. Um, and even if you don't see an immediate use for it, you never know what's going to happen uh, down the line. Um, Machine learning clearly is, is, you know, uh, is really hitting some home runs now. It's, it's able to do a lot of um, fantastic things, not just with this, but in you know, image classification and all sorts of other applications. Um, and you know, using machine learning for, for X is, a, is a, a fun thing to do and can, can have great success. Uh, and of course, connect the camera itself and the, the skeletal tracking it, um, uh, technology is allowing us to do a lot of um, fun new applications and taking them out of the lab in, in many cases as well. So I will say thank you very much. Well, if, if Kinect cannot recognize fingers, how could it let you play the virtual violin in the ad? Could, could, so could you build a virtual violin? Yeah. Um, in theory, if, yeah, if you could track the fingers very accurately, you could imagine building some kind of air violin or air guitar. Um, of course, there's, there's a, the subtle issue of haptic feedback, and you know one of the reasons that people can play violin well is that they have, when they push down on the string, they feel it. 
Um, and when they sort of bow, they can feel the, the pressure on that. And, and so dealing with that issue to actually really generate what feels like a useful air violin would, would be very hard, I think. However, there may be other instruments that you could imagine, new instruments that have never existed, um, you know, like the theremin, but, you know, new versions thereof that, that might feel more natural and might be quite interesting. Other questions? Down here? Yep. How does the resolution of the new connect compare to the old so that's a really interesting question. How does the resolution of the old connect compare with the new connect? Um, the thing about the old connect is, even though, so, so let me just tell you the numbers on paper. I mean, the, the old connect is 64480, notionally, uh, and the new one is 512424, I think. So it sounds like it's smaller. Um, however, the, the resolution of the old connect is not actually, you know, n not every pixel is independent, and that's because of that pattern of dots. So what happens is the pattern of dots is shined out into the world, um, and you have to aggregate, uh, you have to match a pattern, which means you have to match over some small region of the world, which means that the effective number of pixels you have is much smaller than you would think from the, the, the number on paper. Um, so, so the new connect is considerably, you know, in practice it's considerably more uh, detailed. The, the, um, the edges are much better, um, and also the Z resolution is also much higher. Um, that's a good question. I don't know the precise details of how it's manufactured, but um, essentially you want something that is um, pretty random um, because you want it to be non-repeating. You could, you could design it once. Uh, I, think, I think it's something like injecting bubbles into some bit of plastic. It's something like that, and you do that sort of randomly, and then you have to calibrate each individual camera. Um, but I don't know the precise details on how that's manufactured. You have to have some kind of symmetry about the object, the way you did this, right? So you wouldn't, would you be able to track like an amorphous kind of shape? Um, so there's nothing, you don't have to have anything symmetrical here. The fact that the human body is symmetrical is actually a nuisance factor um, because you've then got to, you know, this thing looks very much like this thing and you've got to work out which side is which, and actually that's one of the hardest things, is working out is the left hand the right, uh, and the right, which, which is left and which is right. Um, could you use it to track something more amorphous? Um, I don't see why not. If you could get some training data of, to represent that, I, I expect this would work you know, reasonably well out of the box. Um, you said that you, in the mocap sessions, you had about 100,000 poses, and before you said that it was a very painstaking process to label such poses. I take it you didn't manually, did you manually label 100,000 poses? I Aha. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> sorry, sorry if that was confusing. Okay, so the, the painstaking bit is taking the, um, let me just bring up the relevant slide, because this will, uh, oops. Um, the painstaking bit is doing the uh, manual painting of the training images. So, where is it gone? This one. The painstaking bit is um, taking that and creating that by hand. That would be very painful. The, the, the cheap, the relatively much, much cheaper way of doing things was the idea of, um, where's it gone? Uh, going to the uh, motion capture studio, here we go, um, and recording mocap, which is just the, the joint positions and the joint angles, and using that to generate using computer graphics, the, both the depth image and these, these things using sort of texture maps essentially on the, on the body. So um, you don't, you know, we didn't have to paint these manually. Um, we could just basically get some, a couple of people to put on one of these full body suits and move around for a few hours record that, and then we could generate as much data as we wanted from that. Yeah, last question, please. Uh, uh, you said you used very, uh, very deep trees. Uh, how did you avoid overfitting? Um, so through lots of data. Um, so, I mean, the more data you have, the, the less likely you, you are to overfit. Um, clearly, decision trees are, are potentially very prone to overfitting. And purely through, through lots of data here is, is, is how we avoided it. You know, there are some, 
heuristics you can use, like not splitting nodes that don't have enough training samples and things like that. We didn't bother with that because we had all of this, this data and we had enough, you know, we engineered enough. We, we actually spent about six months building the distributed training um, algorithm to be able to scale it up to that, that um, length, of, uh, to, to the sort of this scale. Sure. Another couple of questions at the end of the, of the, the session, but we'll close sure. the session for today um, and send you off go-karting. So <laughs> thanks a lot for attending uh, today. We'll continue with parallel sessions tomorrow morning then. Okay, thank you, Jamie. Thank you. <laughs>